Yeah, uh, praise the Lord. Bwana sifiwe sana. Amen. Amen. Yeah, uh, allow me to introduce myself as Clinton. Uh, uh, I'm away from my home, so I think uh, at this point I don't have my wife close to me. But uh, you know, the other the other day you were able to to meet my family. I uh, thank the Lord. We we are celebrating uh, ten years in marriage uh, on eleventh of uh, August, and we bless the Lord for the grace. I know, and I'm humbled to be in this class by. Uh, Doctor, I'll just be able to 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 scroll to do to presentation by my own, so that's okay. Uh, I am blessed to be here, and I'm humbled. And I'm talking to many of us who have been in marriage for many years, and uh, by the grace of God, we are going to exchange ideas as we continue with this class on uh, marriage as uh, the Lord will be leading us. So uh, I'd like us to have a, a scripture that uh, I always call my theology in marriage. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Uh, we can have a reading there. The book of Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. If you are with me, you can go with, you can read with me. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Uh, the Bible says, uh, give me one minute, I just reached there. The Bible says in verse 18, the Lord said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. So that is the theology of my marriage the beginning of my, my marriage the understanding of my, my 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 spouse is basically from that particular scripture which is talking about uh, god intended to make a helper for me and now the question that will come on board is that what about what about uh, what about uh, those who are wives what, what what is the take of God there, or who are they as far as is concerned? And I'm glad we are having ladies here, and um, probably it's hard for them to connect to this statement. But let us look at it. The Bible is talking about it's not good. And when you look at uh, Genesis chapter one verse thirty one, it gives us a situation that leads to God making it, uh, making the confession or rather the declaration that he's making here. The Bible talks about, I will make him, uh, which means I'll make for him. And Paul comes in first Corinthians chapter 11, verse 19, where he says that, um, it was within, the plan of God for us, for God to create man and God to create woman and to bring together the two. And that brings the fulfillment of the happiness of either. That is the man or the, 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 the wife. And in this scenario, he's talking about the, the gender. But time has gone by and things have really changed. Uh, this class, we want to come back to the intention of God in marriage, and we want to let this marriage into uh, ministry. We want to have a ministry focus into uh, what God intended for us. You realize that uh, the word helper, uh, it simply brings the issue of uh, uh, bringing in more strengths or brings in an aspect of um, uh, or rather it eliminates any component of somebody being weaker or somebody being stronger than the other or somebody being inferior rather than being superior. It really brings in an aspect of uh, a match, uh, something that uh, uh, complements the, the other one. 
when God talks about I'm bring for you a helper, it has nothing to do man was superior and neither does it bring out an aspect of uh, a woman being weaker, but it's an aspect of complement complementation. So that's my marriage theology. And I believe we all resonate we, uh, we resonate with this this statement or the phrase we have read in Genesis uh, two eighteen of a helper, and uh, where God did not make man to be stronger than the woman or the wife or the husband to be stronger than the wife or the the other way around, and it's nothing to do with the uh, inferiority but an aspect of uh, being able to complement each other. So first of all, I take my marriage to be a place of complement, a place of training, a place of preparation, where God uh, is making me to become a full person whom he envisioned or whom he created in, the, in chapter one of Genesis. Now, when you look at chapter, when you look at Matthew, I'm just going through the theology of my marriage. When you look at... Uh, Matthew chapter 19, verse 4 to 6. Uh, I will read, the Bible says that, uh, have, you not, have you not read that uh, he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. But therefore God has joined together, no man shall put a santa. In most cases, uh, it becomes difficult for us to, to to understand this particular this particular paragraph or passage or part of the Bible that talks about no man should put us under, and we bring in a number of argument and all that stuff. But you'll agree with me that once you choose to go the marriage way, you become one and. It is not easy uh, to put us under what God has put one, uh, what God has made to be one. So my theology of marriage, as I've said, one, my wife is uh, my compl uh, compliments me. It's not that he's uh, a weaker vessel and it is within the goodness of God to make uh, life uh, good for me and to fulfill the, 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 the to fulfill the, the joy that uh, he created in me uh, to fulfill the happiness he created uh, for me. And then number two, uh, I say that um, uh, the purpose of marriage is for complement. And uh, now my theology again is that we are meant to be together, regardless of, regardless of the situation, regardless of the circumstance. We are not, we are not to be in marriage for a season. Uh, people say that we are the things we do for a season, but for me, marriage is something I, I I envision to be of eternity. It is something to be there forever, not something that's going to be there for for a short period of time. So, what God has joined together, it really implies is not merely a human agreement. So, it's not an issue of an agreement that we come together and agree. The Bible talks about what God has joined together. No man shall put a Santa. It simply, it simply implies that marriage is not a human, it's not a merely a human agreement, but a relationship in which God cha changes the status of man and a woman from being single and to being one. So, uh, as we continue, we'll, uh, we are going to look at different approaches of marriage. Uh, we are going to look at the administration of marriage, which, uh, uh, well, uh, we are going to look at so many, so many types of marriages, like what Jimmy talked about last. But before we reach there, we need to start this class, knowing that when we talk about marriage, well, my theology is that we are talking about one flesh. We are not talking about two flesh. We are talking about one flesh because that's what the Bible talks about. We're going to demonstrate to you through this class how you are one flesh and how it is very difficult, or rather how God is against, uh, 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 you know, 
uh, the separation that leads to divorce and uh, the, uh, what leads to remarriage. So it is very difficult at this point of, in time to argue out this aspect of one flesh, but you're going to see the God intention of making us one flesh. Now, we need to understand that from the moment we got married, or rather once the marriage starts, we mysteriously, we, we mysteriously belong to no other relationship uh, apart from to each other. We have rights within marriage that are not human given, humanly given, but are God given. We have responsibilities that are not given by your clan or by your society or by tribe or by your ethnicity, but rather given by God. Being one flesh, uh, this is the theology. I'm just taking you through the theology of my marriage or rather my theology on marriage and family. According to my understanding, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, which I know most of us, we are well conversant with it. It says one flesh, uh, man who shall leave his parent and allow me just to read that because I'm having my Bible here. The Bible says in, uh, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is sent to his wife and they become one flesh. And uh, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Uh, it is more than it is more than we can think or imagine of just leaving our household. For example, I'm married from Embu. So it's just more than my wife leaving Embu and joining a young man from Mias. I come from Mias. And so whatever place we live, it's, it, it is more than leaving your homestead. It's more than leaving your household. It's more than I leaving my parents or my brothers and going to live with my wife. And it's more than my wife leaving uh, her, si her siblings to come and live with me. It, it, it is feel more than that. So as we continue this marriage, as we continue this class in the next five weeks, we need to look at marriage beyond us being two people in the house or we need to look beyond at uh, the aspect of living your parents a physical living in the sense of uh, uh, changing location or geographical location and we need to look at it in a uh, something that god has intended for us to establish another uh, fundamental unit of our society which is basically a family so uh, our loyalty to each other, it comes from the understanding of um, our loyalty to each other. It is rooted deeply in uh, understanding of family unit and marriage as one flesh in the sense that uh, the children that come out of this marriage, they demonstrate that oneness that has been, uh, has been spoken by God. It is such an institution that is permanent, is an institution that is permanent. It's not an institution that is for convenience. It's not a, a season that is for, for a short time. It's an institution that is, is established and it is to be there for as long as God has given you opportunity to and privilege to be alive. So, Marriage is a, a permanent bond between, uh, between the spouses or between a man and a woman that joins them into a union that is concentrated by physical intercourse, which is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. So the union of this marriage, it is uh, on the understanding or on the grounds of, of a physical intercourse. When you when you, you join each other in sex or when you have that cleaving or when you are having sexual intercourse, okay, there is a bond that is created and that bond cannot be separated. 
either by financial conflicts or uh, insecurity of whatever, or whatever that you can give us a reason or infidelity that can cause that separation. It is a bond that cannot be broken under whatsoever reason or, 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 or subject. It is a bond. I will compare this to taking two, I always demonstrate this by you take two, you take two papers. One is green color and the other one is white color. And you put glue on both of them and then you stick them together. And so what happens is that after a period of time, you separate the two. They cannot be separated. You'll just tear them apart. And once you tear them apart, they cannot be of any use and so whatever. So my theology of marriage is that I'm in a permanent bond with my wife through physical intercourse, as it is spoken in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. We're going to go through our class as we continue, and we're going to an, an earth of all those things. I'll give you a number four uh, theology of my marriage in Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. If you have your Bible, you can read with me. The book of Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. We get another theology of marriage. And as we go through this, uh, what I mean by <clears throat> the theology of my, uh, what, what I mean by theology of my marriage or theology of marriage or my marriage theology, I am simply meaning what keeps my marriage, what helps me to, continue focusing on my marriage and what makes me value other people's marriage is what I'm talking about here. Now, let us look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 18, uh, and, uh, and just get to understand a few things on what Paul is, is, is writing as far as the issue of marriage is concerned. So as you are in this class, I would like you to look at your own theology of marriage I look at what the Bible, what, what, why, what, what is in your Bible that makes you value your wife? What is in your Bible that makes you uh, treasure uh, your, your marriage or your family? Or what makes you to respect other families or marriages? Now, when you look at the book of Colossians chapter 3, verse 18, and the book of Colossians chapter 3, verse 18, uh, wives submit uh, yourselves to you, your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Well, I know uh, I know there are a number of uh, there are a number of uh, arguments uh, that will arise from this. But look at what Paul writes and says. Wives, you know, he's actually responding to uh, issues that were affecting uh, that church, and one of the issues was the aspect of uh, sub submission. And so he comes in and he gives a directive and says, wives, submit to your husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. So you look at how he puts it there. He puts it all together. Now, instead of telling the wives, now when look at the word uh, obey, in this particular passage we have read, in Greek it simply means hyperkonio, uh, which is a uh, which is um, which is related to submit, and it is a conviction of men to have the leadership plan of the family given to them by God. So the leadership role, uh, it is a God given. It's a God given to to God to the husbands. So according to the Greek, uh, the word obey here, which simply means uh, hyper. Hyperconeo, and it is bringing in the aspect of um, submit, which is hypertaso, and it is based on the conviction that men have a God given leadership role in the family. So the term is simply refers to the order of a given society. There must be order, there must be kind of, I'll be talking about uh, as we move on, I'll be talking about how admi different administrations of marriages or uh, different um, types of marriage where we have administration whereby man is the head uh, and then another marriage, uh, we are equals and another marriage, the wife is, is, is the head. I'll be talking about such, uh, that, that, that type of administrations in marriage as you continue. Then you'll be able to relate with your, uh, with your model of marriage 
or your worldview of marriage. There are those who hold of the view that man is the head, and there are those who hold of the view that women are um, we, women are subject to men and all that stuff. But in this context of uh, Colossians chapter three, uh, in this uh, passage of Colossians chapter three verse eighteen, the word obey, which has some meaning as submit, it's a reference to man assuming the God-given responsibility of taking the, le the leadership of the family. And it's not because man is superior, as I've spoken in the previous, uh, my, my first uh, theology of marriage in Genesis chapter two, verse 18, that in this case, there's, not, there's no one who is superior and there's no one, uh, there's no one who is superior and there's no one who is inferior, but we complement each other. But now when we talk about man becoming the leader of the family, it is an issue of uh, order. It's an issue of an order or uh, in a society. In any given administration, in any given institution, in any given government, there must be a leader. There must be somebody taking that lead of that particular institution. And so in the institution of family, God has given man to take the lead. God has given man, it is a God-given God um, responsibility of taking that lead. And so Paul is talking to, Paul is talking to, to the church of Colossae and is telling them to, um, to, to, to obey this particular leadership or rather to submit to this particular leadership. So when God is talking to have to submit, basically, He's just talking about submission to the leadership of the husband. And the leadership of the husband is God given. And this leadership is for the order of the society, order of the family. It is a kind of hierarchy to say. So uh, the term suggests that um, uh, the wives now need to align to that order so that there is flow. Uh, in that regard, one of the theology, one of my marriage theology is Ephesians chapter 22, uh, chapter uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 to 33. I'll be reading it later. But Paul is not enjoining the wife to follow the prevailing cultural patterns of the day, but a life that is fitting in the Lord. And he repeats when you look at um, uh, between Colossians chapter 3 18 to Colossians chapter 4. Uh, verses one, Paul speaks about the issue of uh, uh, of, 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 of submission, uh, basically like seven times. But when he's talking about submission, it's not a lawyer thing, neither is it a Kikuyu thing or a Kalenjini thing, no. He says in the Lord, not as lawyers do, but in the Lord. So it's not a cultural issue, it's not a Western, a, a Western thing, it is in the Lord as it fits the Lord. In other words, you do it now with the focus of the Lord. Our, 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 our guest speaker in our last class, they did speak that um, number, one, uh, number one priority in their marriage that has led them to be in marriage for 54 years is bringing Jesus in front. In other words, asking Jesus, if Jesus, you are the one who has come home late, and you find your spouse is asleep, what will you do? If there's no finance in the family, what will you do? If my spouse has lost job, what will I do? If uh, our house has not been paid rent and I have the rent, what will I do? So you realize that it's, it is a question of constantly asking yourself, what could Jesus do? Putting Jesus in that particular space and asking yourself, how will Jesus do? So it is an issue of submission to the leadership of the family, not in the cultural sense, not in the society sense, not by any given constitution, but as it fits the Lord. Of course, the Lord is the one who initiated this leadership in that marriage. It's the Lord who initiated that leadership. The author of that leadership of that institution of marriage is God. The, 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 you know, the, the founder of that family unit, of that institution is God. And so whatever that you do in terms of submission, whatever that you do in terms of obedience, 
it is to come from the Lord. And so uh, I am bringing my argument on my theology of marriage is that um, I always ask myself, am I loving my wife the way, the, the way the Lord loves his church? Am I loving my wife the way the Lord loves her? And uh, when I talk about God loving her, uh, does it mean a few days? Does it mean being mean to her? Does it mean not caring about her emotions? But what does it really mean? And basically, the way God intercedes for me, that's how I intercede for my wife. The way God uh, comes in to rescue me, to, to, to whatever God does to me, whatever love God shows, 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 shows to me, that is the same thing that I give it back. Now, uh, I want us to look at... Um, I want us to look at the roots of uh, I want us to look at the roots of Paul. So we need to to evaluate hap whatever happens in marriage. Remember, I'm talking about the theology of marriage. That is the subject I'm talking today, the theology of marriage. And uh, I'm saying my theology of marriage is that I have to provide leadership of my family as it. Uh, as, as, as the Lord will do it. I have to look at my marriage and provide leadership with the glasses of God, with the spectacles of God. Now, as I do that, my wife also loves me. Uh, no, no, I love my wife in that case, and my wife submits to my leadership uh, with the lenses of Christ, with the eyeglasses of Christ, or, or other spectacles of, 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 of Christ, because it says, as it, as it, fits, as it fits the Lord. So it is very important that we evaluate, it is very important that when you're carrying out the audit of your family or your marriage, you do it in the light of Christ. You do it in light of the scripture and the teachings of Christ. Now, my fifth theology of marriage, which is very crucial to me to share with you again, it is in the first Peter, first Peter chapter five, verse seven, first Peter chapter five, verse seven. That is where I get um, another theology of my marriage, uh, another theology of my marriage. Today, I'm introducing this class by just taking us through uh, what guides my marriage, what informs my marriage in terms of responsibilities of, 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 of the family, what makes me not ever not to think about divorce, uh, what makes me to value my wife and to be able to uh, handle conflict that come in marriage, and that makes me to remain faithful to my wife. Uh, these are the scriptures that I believe they not only apply to me, they apply to you. I'm just drawing you to the scripture, but not what we promised each other. Uh, or rather, because marriage is not an agreement between me and my wife. Marriage is, it's beyond that. It is something that is initiated by God. So let us look at uh, First Peter, I'm there. Uh, chapter 3, verse 7. Let us look at uh, chapter 3, verse 7. It says, Husbands, in the same way, uh, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker, as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Now, look at it. Look at how the Bible says. I love the scripture. It says that husbands, in the same way, uh, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Now, Peter is giving an advice to the, to the husbands. Well, I'm the husband and Peter is talking to me. And um, uh, the advice of Peter is so compressed. Well, he's addressing is uh, uh, Peter has taken up so many things that were happening in that era or during that particular time, and he compresses all of those things together. He compresses them, and he he makes he compresses all these things that are happening inside this marriage that he's speaking on or speaking about in this family, and he compresses them together. Well, uh, 
perhaps because he addresses at more lengths uh, those under authority who are likely to be mistreated, probably the slaves and the wives. And because he also speaks of a phrase which I would like us to look at, he says, likewise, uh, that means it is a transition. Uh, and, and that it doesn't mean husbands should submit their wives uh, because the scripture uh, is, 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 is saying so. When we look at Ephesians chapter 5, uh, 21 to 33, we get, an, uh, we, we get a picture of uh, the church. We get a picture of... Uh, we get a picture of marriage being 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 an institution that is uh, holy, an institution that uh, is highly reverent, uh, re 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 uh, well, with high regard. Well, I want us to focus us living in the will of God. What is the will of God in marriage? And that is what Paul is speaking. Uh, Peter is speaking here in reference to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 to 33. He focuses on the living a life in marriage that is in line with God's will, which includes understanding the needs of your wife. Well, I know there are people who differ in understanding of that scripture, interpretation of that scripture, and they mean that... Uh, weaker vessel simply refers to uh, you know they are emotional beings they are weak in emotions they can't handle the emotions strongly so we should handle the emotions as well as we deal with them and then again the issue of authority they are weaker vessels some will differ in interpretation and they'll bring in an aspect of emotions an aspect of authority and that's why you'll find women are, are working out to to have equality, we call it gender equality, and sometimes they project in that particular direction. But Peter is really not talking about the physical strengths uh, that we achieve uh, in, uh, in the physical strengths. What somebody said that what man, what man can do, what man can do, what what man can do, women can do better. I don't know how it's put. Uh, Dr. how is it put? What man can do? Dr. Kipchilis, how do they say? What man can do? Yeah, a, a woman can do better. Yeah, it's not really... That is, uh, I will call that as a biblical heresy. It is not... It has nothing to do with physical strength. It does nothing to do with authority. It has nothing to do with emotions at this particular time. We remember the Bible talks of us being the heirs of God. Women and men share an equal destiny. We do share an equal destiny as heirs. That is the grace of life. So Peter does not think women are inferior to men. For both are equal made in God's image. When you look at the book of Galatians chapter 3, the book of Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 and uh, i want us to know that um uh we are equal and peter does not bring out the picture that uh men are superior men are authoritative men are authoritative peter does not bring an aspect of men are stronger emotionally no so god is not uh, peter is not like telling uh, husbands that they should treat women because they are weak emotionally or they are less authoritative. No. And unfortunately, the, the, the human activi activists have brought an, up, up a philosophy that has really, in my view, uh, uh, misinterpreted what God has spoken here. But we are all heirs of the kingdom. Your wife is a heir of the kingdom. Your husband is a heir of the kingdom. And we are equal before the Lord. We are all made in the image of God. And I know people have different connotations about uh, man was created in the image of God and women were created from the ribs of man. All that stuff people talk out here. But one thing I know for sure, my wife was created from the image of God.
Now, at that point, I would like to mention a philosophy that people have been using wrongly uh, in this introduction of marriage class and as we move on. I don't know how many of you have ever heard somebody say, beauty belongs to the eyes of be the beholder. If you are there, you have ever heard that, that, that particular phrase, uh, could you lift up your hand? Beauty belongs to the eyes of beholder. Wonderful, I see a number of hands being lifted. That is, that is a philosophy that we don't have to buy that philosophy because when they say so, they mean that, uh, allow me to use my wife, that Anisia's beauty, it is the, be the beauty of Anisia is in my eyes. That is not true. Uh, what is the wife, keep look at, what is the name of your wife? Jacob, what is the name of your wife? It's Reb Rivka. I'm a Rebecca. So Rebecca, the beauty of Rebecca is not in your eyes. The beauty of Rebecca is not in your eyes. When we say that the beauty is in the beholder, we talk about that our beholder is God and not man, not our spouse. So it is our beauty is with God and not our spouses. That is the understanding that we need to all have, that our beauty is, um, is, is, um, is of God. So it is not a physical strength Paul is talking here. It's not an emotional strength Paul is talking here. It's not authoritative strength that Paul is talking here. Peter is probably talking about that uh, men are physically, that is general knowledge, stronger than women. And uh, they may be tempted to be threat to, to threaten their wives through physical or verbal abuse. Or women and men share an equal destiny as heirs of the of, of, of God. And by so doing, we don't need to come to a point where we threaten our wife in whatever whatsoever. I've never at no point I thought of raising my hand, either my mouth to abuse my wife or to speak something that is not uh, godly to my wife. So I know I and my wife, we are created by the image of God. We are equal and I need to heed to prayer. Now there's some interesting finishing of that scripture. If you read, it says that if husbands don't treat their wives in a godly way, the Lord will pay no heed to their prayers. What this means, if you don't treat your wife well, God will not answer your prayers. That's how the Bible has spoken. I don't know if it's my version that has said so, Consulata, are you here, Kialo? Consulata Kialo, could you read for us the last verse? Well, we have just read the theology of my ma the theology, the theology of marriage in First Peter chapter three, verse seven. Consulata Kialo, could you read for us the the last the last part of that scripture? Consulata Kialo. Consulata Kialo. Do you have your Bible? Consulata Kialo. Well, I see Consulata Kialo is not there. Wellington Asuluda, are you in? Wellington Asuluda? Wellington Asuluda? Wellington? Wellington? Okay, can somebody unmute and read for me uh, First Peter chapter three verse seven, the last part of chapter of verse seven. <clears throat> First Peter chapter, chapter three verse seven, the last yes. part. Yeah, the last part. So that nothing will hinder your prayers. That's a, what I understand by this theology is that once you mistreat your wife in any given way, you have betrayed that theology uh, that we have read from the beginning. And so your prayers, you will not have a breakthrough. In other words, you will just have trouble because you're created to be one. So you can't function properly. 
So at all times, you have to make your ways with your wife in every sense, in everything you do. You have to make sure you are with your wife. You, have, you are in line with your wife. I want to give you another theology of my marriage, or rather the theology of my marriage theology is Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. I see Ben is the one who read the other one. Could you, uh, Ben, read for us? Hebrews 13, verse 4. Hebrews 13, verse 4. I can Let's read. See. Yes, read, read, read. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Yeah, uh, first I want to finish up, uh, before I move to this, uh, the other theology of marriage, which I would like everyone in this class to know. If you want to have a breakthrough in your prayer life, the secret is just love your wife. There are many here who have been praying for so many things, but they are not experiencing the breakthrough. Just make ways with your wife. You will experience tremendous breakthrough in your prayer life. Just make your wife happy. Be in unity with your wife. Just make your wife happy and be in unity with your wife. You don't need to pray seven days fasting, although you need to pray. But you'll realize that God will meet, God will answer your prayers just like that. Now, I'm moving to this other theology that I, I hold in my marriage. Let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage uh, bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. Well, uh, I'll be talking about adultery uh, probably as we move forward because I'm going to look at the perversions of marriage and I'm going to look at as other aspects of marriage. And uh, one of the things I'm also going to look at uh, the balance between marriage and ministry, where do you place ministry and where do you place marriage? And I'm going to talk about uh, the place of marriage in ministry. So I'm going to handle all, all, all of this. Uh, as you know, we, all, we always have a very short period uh, uh, of interaction. But... Uh, today, as I focus on building uh, our foundation for our class, I'm concentrating on the theology of marriage. And one of the theology that we need to look at in our marriage is how do we implement Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4? How do we implement Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4? Or how do we work with the church members? Or how do we lead our flock? It is by uh, uh, making... Uh, uh, um, um, uh, ho uh, okay, Hel holding our marriage in honor. Uh, holding our marriage in honor. Once you reach at that point where you value your spouse, you value your marriage. Then I want to say that uh, you will be reaching to a point where your blessings, your joy, your peace will be something others will be talking about. Others will be aspired. So the happiness of your marriage begins on how you regard your marriage. Where do you place your marriage? You as a spouse in that marriage, where have you placed your spouse? If you're a husband, where, where have you put? If you don't value your wife, that's when you'll be just talking to your wife the way you want. If you are a pastor in this forum and you don't value marriages, that's when you'll be uh, talking or rather handling marriages in your church without care. And that's how you'll, not, you'll be speaking to uh, other women in the church without care or other men in the church without care. You'll not care if they, they are husband to somebody or they are uh, husband or wives to somebody. You'll just talk, 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 talk the way you want. But once you value marriage, you'll also uh, uh, value God, you'll value Jesus, and you'll, va you'll value any given woman in the church, you'll value any given woman in the church, and you'll value any given husband in the church. And by so doing, you'll care what will come out of your ir 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 reckless behavior or what will, come, uh, uh, what will come out of 
your misconduct with women or misconduct with, with, with men. So the, st the starting point of this theology is holding your marriage with respect, holding your marriage with that dignity. Well, justice, ch justice, Chastity, uh, chastity, chastity in marriage, it is abstaining sex in marriage. That's the word I'm talking about here. It is warned by God. We need to come to a point where we need to hold our marriage with that dignity. And when I talk about marriage in this context, uh, uh, the sex life or rather what makes us the cleaving part of it, of marriage, the intimacy part of it. We need to value it. And the more we, uh, the more we hold it with that dignity, or rather with that high esteem, that's how we keep our marriage one, not only uh, pure and close, but we also prevent our spouses from perversion, from sexual perversion the things as pornography, adultery, infidelity, and also other sexual urge that will cause others to fall in sin and will not defile our marriage. Or remember marriage to me, it's a covenant. It's not just beyond the physical aspect. It is a covenant. It is something that is initiated uh, in, the spiritual, in the spiritual realm. It is something that is more of God than is more of me. My marriage is more of God than me. My marriage is more of God than my wife. And so anytime I get out of what is not expected, I'm kind of betraying God. I'm like on cheating on God. I'm like betraying God and not just my wife. And so as we move on, friends, uh, it is a warning that we are given here about sexual immorality. Uh, in Greek, it is ponos and a general term which refers to uh, engagement in sexual contact outside marriage between a man and a, a, a woman, or rather, in so simple sim simplicity, it is uh, adult, 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 which in Greek it means moikos. It refers to anyone who is unfaithful to a spouse. And we are being warned in this particular passage of the Bible uh, that we as believers, we as the members of the body of Christ, we, as the, 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 the saints, we have to, to be very careful and we need to, 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 the Bible talks about we are not of this world. So in no way we should be lured in the things that happen in this world, but we should always be controlled by the scripture in everything. And that's why it has been important for me uh, I felt it, it is so worthy for us to start building this class from us understanding the, the foundations of marriage. Actually, I will have used another word, the foundations of marriage and what constitutes our marriage. And so as I'm taking you through this 10 point uh, theology, theolo theology, theological aspects of marriage, I'd like you to bring up your marriage when you leave this place. I'd like you to look at your wife and value that wife. When you value your wife, you're valuing marriage. When you're valuing your marriage, you're valuing God in that marriage. Now, let us look at another theology that makes me to respect marriage in Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse nine to 10. The Bible says two are better than one and because they have a good reward for their toil. Uh, for if they fall and uh, one will lift, one will lift uh, his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and uh, and has not and has not another to lift and has not another to lift him, the wise person will work side by side with another, enjoying a good reward and finding help in terms of need. The wise person will pursue cooperative ventures rather than give it in jealousy, striving to be fast. So, marriage is a point where we need to come in uh, with the view of serving the other one not the view of being served, but the view of serving the other spouse. So I am in this marriage with Anisia, and every time I think of Anisia, I think of how best I can serve Anisia. Now, 
with time, we are going to look at love, love, love languages, which are at some point I did, I did post on our wall, the love languages. Um, part of it is service, part of the love language is service. And I do believe that everybody on this platform, uh, no one had service. And so as if you want to enrich your marriage, don't, don't be of that person or I'm not for that person. I'm not telling you, no, don't be, but I would like you to look at it in this sense. Why don't you begin it serving your spouse? When you serve this, your spouse, that is, okay, out of the value or you have of your wife, you will have a, 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 an urge, a commitment to compliment her. You'll have a commitment to serve her. You'll have a commitment to hold her highly. And as you serve her, it will be very difficult to abuse her, to harass her, to do whatever wrong that will hurt her in the end. Because you're looking at marriage as not a physical agreement or rather a human agreement, but you're looking at her as a spiritual agreement that God has placed you in and there is no room for divorce. There is no room for separation because it's an institution that God has already said that no man shall put a Santa. And in that connection, you will always desire of opportunity that will come for you to serve your wife, serving your wife in the households, uh, household cor uh, corals or rather the work that happens within the house, serving your wife in ministry, serving your wife in prayer, and uh, the thing, the spiritual disciplines, working through you with your wife, and being there to serve your wife. And as you do so, your wife also does the same. Your wife also does the same. As a husband, you'll always want to provide leadership as God has given to you. When you are prayerful, God will always give you uh, that, that position of leadership of your family. And as your wife is also prayerful, God will always bring into her the submission to that leadership because the two of you, you have found the leadership from God the understanding of the leadership from God. And the more you remain naked to each other, the more you remain naked to each other, the more you become open to each other, and the more God strengthens up your family, and the more God strengthens up your marriage, and the more you inspire marriages within the church or within the body of Christ, and the more you become a blessing to the body of Christ. So, I'm just laying to you today the foundations of marriage, and I'm taking you through the scripture. And through the scripture, we are, we are coming up with the, the theology of marriage. Now, when you look at, uh, 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 instead of striving in marriage, instead of being jealousy uh, in marriage, there are several things that cause, bring jealousy within marriage. But those, those, those happens to those who, con who conform to the patterns of this world, but not to those who conform to what the Bible speaks about their marriage. Now, in the book of Genesis chapter two, verse 23 and 24, uh, it's a scripture we read, and I would like to read it once more because I want to give another explanation of it. It says that then the man said this, uh, uh, then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of my man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, uh, my dear friends on this platform, uh, I want us to say that there's no companion in this world who is more suitable for you there is no companion in this world who is more suitable for you than your spouse or than your wife or than your husband so as who are of god as who are uh, who are who are believers we need to come to the level where we need to find the comfort, the peace, the love, whatever you talk about, the loyalty that we seek in other, in other people 
in our houses, in our families, in our marriages, in our spouses. What those terms are meaning, I'm referring to you as a couple. And so uh, when no suitable companion is found among all the living things, God fashions a woman from the man's own flesh. And now the text highlights the sense of oneness that exists between the man and the woman. And Adam joyfully proclaims himself this. Look at how Adam speaks this. How often have we spoken this to our spouses? When we are celebrating our anniversaries or when we are, when we are, when we are taking our dinner, when we are waking up, going to work, uh, when we are celebrating each other's birthday, when we have come back at home, can we, uh, can we join Adam and say these words, this at last is the bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. This is a terminology which is bringing in the aspect of um, oneness. Oneness. We are one in the creation. We are one in everything that we do. So my theology, uh, my, my theology creates the close the, the, the closeness. I am with my wife. Now, uh, you are with your spouse or your husband. It is important that every morning, one way of looking at your marriage with the eyes of God is looking your marriage as a creation that was created by God. We only have one. Eve for Adam, Adam for Eve. We don't have several Eves for Adam. And that's why I've never thought about polygamy in any given contest, uh, remarriage in any given contest. Uh, I want to instead here that I did my research on remarriage and I did a paper on remarriage and marriage. And I was at forgetting for marriage and remarriage. And I know when I open up uh, the chat, I know there will be a lot of questions on remarriage and marriage. But I want to say at this point is that um, uh, the divine pattern for marriage is established in our creation. And we need to look at it in that particular direction where our obligation as husbands, our obligation as wives overrides any other obligation given to us by our father or our mother or our clan or whatsoever. And that's why we need to hold on our wife, we need to hold on our husband. Regardless, we need to hold them with high esteem. So I know we have mother-in-laws here, we have father-in-laws here, or we are going to be one at some point, a father-in-law or a mother-in-law. But I want to say, let us release our children, or rather let us release uh, the, the children that God has blessed us to go and be one. And let us hold our spouses as one, not holding them uh, back. So the issue of marriage, as Paul speaks in uh, 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 Ephesians chapter 5, 25 to, 20, 25 to 32, is the same that we read in this text <clears throat> that we have just uh, read here. Let us hold fast our spouses. Above all, let us hold them fast. Uh, I see our time is up. It's actually one hour. But allow me just to finish up within one minute. I will be, I will be, I'll, 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 I'll be switching off. The sense of being made for each other is further reflected in the word play involving the terms man and woman. So the word man and woman in Hebrew, it means ish and aishasha. As a result of this spe special affiliation, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 observes that when a man leaves his parents and takes up a wife, they shall become one flesh, one unit, one union. Woman is consummated in sexual intercourse. Jesus appeals this verse in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, in a setting out of this view of marriage. In Matthew, Matthew chapter 19, verse 4 to 5. Uh, if you allow me, I'll say that 
you are created when you finish this class after this class i, I will i will tell you to go and tell your wife you are created for me you are created for me and i like you to know that you're created for that spouse go and tell your husband you are created for me and that is you we are one union we are not two unions in the house we are one union you're not two tribes in the house we are one union we are one person so when you look at when we'll be talking of other factors in marriage you will, you will realize that you are one regardless we'll be talking about the theology of finance in marriage we'll be talking about other theologies of marriage when you talk about finances you realize that there's no money for the wife there's no money for the husband because you are one union you are one institution you are one person you are created by one so you need to hold on that view because you are one now uh please allow me just to finish up but before i finish up let me i find it necessary just to read for you matthew uh chapter 19 verse 4 to 5 it says haven't you read he replied that at the beginning the creation made them male and female and said for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife and the two will become one flesh now let us look at uh, the another theology as i finish up i say just give me two minutes i'll be finishing up isaiah 62 isaiah 62 verse 5 for as a uh, for a, a young a young man marries a young woman so shall your sons marry you as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride so shall your god rejoice over you our sons are the loyal inhabitants of zion here the internal city of god as it is proclaimed in psalms chapter 87 well this is a poetic message this is a poetic message uh, or a poetic image that indicates the inhabitants of jerusalem will love and cherish their city the inhabitants of zion will forever be committed to a de and delight in their internal dwellings for the lord's people are there and the lord himself is there so isaiah's prophetic imagery leaves an overwhelming impression of joy delight righteousness beauty safety peace and so we need to we need to create our marriage as a safe place a place where people will find joy we need to create our marriage and we need to make our spouses develop confidence in us we need to create our family to be a place where is a safe landing when your where your wife can count on the genuine love at, at her home or his home a genuine reception genuine uh, reciprocation genuine compliment uh from that home where there is there is that safetyness and uh, that we may think or uh, or figure out now uh boldly drawing on a familiar human image of that is uh, the impression that uh, isaiah is bringing out here the aspect of delight so you ask yourself what is the intent of god in this marriage the intent of god is for you to delight once you walk within the plans of god the will of god you'll find that happening and it starts by you protecting your spouse protecting the people of your spouse uh, going to that particular point and honoring them and exalting your spouse at every other time the last one is in first corinthians i couldn't finish by mentioning first corinthians chapter 7 verse 2 to 5 so uh you can get there by yourself you read by yourself but let me finish up by saying the corinthians are commanded to be faithful in their marriage to avoid divorce and to be to content in their calling paul uses the phrase now concerning for the first time here it is in other words he's changing his subject he's changing his oral speech and is now moving to issues that were raised to the church and he's saying uh he speaks a number of stuff but he comes in and, 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 and introduces another topic, which is the topic I'm talking to us today. God designed marriage as the place of the expression of human sexuality. I repeat this to all of us who are in this class. 
God designed marriage as the place for expression of human sexuality. Sex within marriage has both relational and spiritual benefits. Additionally, sex in marriage pra practically helps in reducing some temptations to engage in sexual sin. So what I'm trying to say, friends, uh, marriage is an institution and it was designed by God to be a place where we express our human sexuality. It's a place where we relate to each other and it's a place where we connect with God. Anytime you are engaging in sex, in, in sexual intercourse with your spouse, you are connecting with God. So this hour, I would like to leave us and then uh, let you um, uh, not take much of your time so that you can, you can go reflect on that. But I want you to know that um, sex in marriage has spiritual benefits has relational benefits, and also it helps us to remain in a place of safety, a place of, uh, of, of delight, a place of joy, a place of righteousness, and a place of fulfillment. As we continue, God shall bless you. There are books I've posted on that when we started the class about the sacred marriage. You read that book and you see how marriage is a sacred place. God bless you. I welcome questions, but I would advise you type them on your chat so that you can have them later. Thank you, brother. Uh, brother, keep, keep chillies. I end the class at that point. If there is any question, I'll be happy to respond. Okay, thank you, Bishop. I'm not seeing any question on the chat box. Unless somebody asks one, maybe they can raise their hand. Because so far there is otherwise we want to appreciate the lectures you've given us today. And uh, because I'm not seeing any question, maybe we can just end the class. Yeah, God bless you so much. Allow me to welcome Benson Moema to call to close the class by word of prayer. You can make remarks and then pray. Benson Mwema? Benson Mwema? Yes. You can make a remark and then close the class. Thank you so much for the for the class. I think we, we have a lot to share about the family, and I thank God for the direction we are taking. So may the Lord be with us. So should I pray? Yes, yes. Let us pray. Mighty and everlasting Father, we thank you and we worship your name. We give you praise and we honor you, Lord, because of your plans. Thank you because you are executing every plan in our lives at your appointed time. Thank you for your servant as he continues to share and to your Father to prepare. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit is going to lead him. For all of us, Lord, I pray that you help us, Jehovah Father, to continue to log in, and Jehovah Father, help those who are far, God, to connect, King of all the glory. We thank you and we honor your name. For the night, we pray that we are going to be saved on your hands. We give you glory and we honor you in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you and God bless you. Amen.